this week? Shopping? No. How many seriously are you ready? Have you been shopping for Christmas? Anybody here? There's. Wow, I, I, that's impressive. I am really amazed. That's, that's quite something. I, I am not. I am not at all ready. Praise God. Well, we're going to continue on in Genesis this week. As you know, the next couple of weeks are just filled with stuff. I'm looking forward to our service on the 21st. The young people have been working on a fantastic drama there's some music going on. It, it, it's the regular Abundant Life Family Christmas on the 21st. And, of course, that Sunday night we have our, our Christmas party. And we always have a lot of fun with that. And uh, so make sure to mark that on your calendar. Bring a friend on the 21st, somebody that doesn't normally go to church. They're going to be uh, really blessed and uh, uh, encouraged uh, uh, in the understanding of Jesus more and more. So... You know, come out for that. It's going to be a lot. I mean, there's all kinds of celebrations going on. The youth, the young adults are having some celebration. We've got the all-church Christmas party. It's, it's a time for parties, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you have your Bibles, we're going to, we're going to go through uh, and continue on our series in Genesis here, and we'll pick it up uh, beginning of January again, um, kind of taking a break for the, the deeper perspective on the incarnation and things like that. But if you have your Bibles, we're on day number six here, Genesis chapter one. And if you've been involved in the class at all on Sunday mornings or, or Sunday nights, you have, uh, you've been in, inundated with the scientific data and uh, all kinds of stuff about creation and, and evolution as well. And, and today we're going to meander through scripture here, um, uh, G- Genesis chapter one, verse 26, and I'm going to read all the way through verse 31. The Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, multiply, fill and subdue it, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with its seed and fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And I saw, And God saw... Everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. You know, the Bible says, and God saw everything and saw it was very good. You know what that means? That means that at one point, mankind was very good. I don't know if we watch uh, television today, you can watch the news. Um, you can consider the things that might be going on in, uh, in a little town in Missouri there. And you might say, sometimes man is really not very good. But you know, the Bible says right here that in the beginning, God created everything, and it was very good. It was very good. So something changed, didn't it? Something changed, and of course, that thing is sin. So when I look at this, I'm really considering really the thing that separates us from the animal kingdom, and there's a lot. We've learned so much uh, in the class uh, from Institute for Creation Research that we are very different from monkeys. Supposedly, we came from apes and, uh, you know, sort of uh, evolved that way. And we've learned that, that just a fraction of the DNA is really the only portion that they've been able to compare. They've, they've compared things like our respiratory system and our um, um, things that make us digest food. And those things are similar to the monkeys, but they're also similar to antelope and bear and, and, and foxes and cats. My old cat Dudley, Dudley God bless his soul, I have shared some similarities with Dudley right there. A little less furry, maybe, but not so much the older I get, I should say. Um, so we've discovered there's a lot of differences, actually, and, and the similarity proponent, the proponents that, that say evolution, that we share the same DNA, where, in fact, there's only just a couple of things that match up. Even though, you know, human genetics and, and human appearance are different from uh, other animals and are less apparent, uh, but more important, reasons that, un- that, that determine the nature of man, who we are. See, God created us so uniquely. And in this chapter in Genesis, it really tells us that, that man was created in the image of God. 
So God, you know, I mean, look at me. So God must be good looking, right? So God created us in his image. He created male and female, and he made us like him, a quality that separates us from the animals in this very special sixth day. And a special creation explains why man's behavior were, is far more complex than any other living creature on the planet. We are definitely unique. We're special. And, and man reveals God's ways in many, many ways. And for example, we are able to create objects never seen before. Um, art and buildings. Uh, this morning there were instruments being played intricately with you know, fingers being and things being beaten on and in a rhythmic way, so perfectly, sometimes in tune. And, <laughs> and, and you think about the intricacies of all that. And, and I know, you know, I've been in building for many years, of building buildings and um, uh, some big buildings and little buildings, big, huge houses, a, church, a big church and, and all kinds of things. And I have seen, you know, the, the intricacies permitted in that. And someone thought of this stuff. Even our old little barn that we have here, this, someone thought of it. Somebody had an idea. Someone had a dream. And, and, of course, we've added on to it. We've given it a facelift here and there. We've done all this kind of stuff. But, I mean, no, no other creature on the planet can do those kind of things. That's really unique to us. Uh, able to show compassion for strangers is something that uh, people that's very unique to human beings. And able to ponder our role and, and fate in all of creation, that's something that uh, an ape doesn't think about. I mean, they just don't contemplate what the future holds. Um, you know, as mankind, we also differ from other creatures in our relationship to God. That the Bible says that we have this opportunity to know God. So man, man was created, really, uh, God created man, and man was created to serve other men, but also to serve God. That, that mankind, we serve each other in a fact that uh, forms really the basis of all society. So this is kind of a, another really unique thing to, to, to mankind, ourselves, men and women. And it's the value that God puts on, on mankind that separates us from the rest of all creation. And there's some dominant philosophies out there, though, that are very different, of course, from creation. And the first one, as we've learned over the last several weeks, and you know just from our culture, is atheism, a very strong one. And there's a, a lady. How many have heard of Madeline Murray O'Hare? I got a picture of her here. And uh, she really puts this dominant atheistic idea in perspective. And it, she wrote this. It reads this way. It's two paragraphs, so I'm going to read it. She says, this is the definition, really, of, of atheism and the summary of it. This is your life. What you see is what you get. If you're going to make your life better for yourself, the task is yours. If you want to make the world better for all its inhabitants, all animals, all life forms, all vegetation, you need to work on it. There needs to be a scientific analysis of what we have, what we want, and how to get from one point to another. No good, uh, no God ever gave any man anything, nor answered any prayer, nor ever will. American atheist, whom I represent, asks you simply to understand that the proper study of man is mankind. We can attain any number of utopian plateaus as we reach for a common sense goal which attracted many of our to our nation, the greatest good for the greatest number. We can reach this goal through education, the scientific method of evaluation, planning, and work. Religion has caused more misery to all humankind of every age of history than any other single idea. You need to be free of irrational ideas. You need to repudiate the, uh, those who would attempt to return to you to medievalism. You need to look forward, not backward. You need to seek joy, not sorrow, love, not fear. And you can do that, do that only when you realize uh, who and what your oppressor was and is. Pretty amazing. That really summarizes the idea. In other words, that this life is it. You are the one who's going to build the utopia of this world. We're all going to jump through the Stargate and develop our own world. Okay. There's another thing out there, another predominant idea that is part of atheism, but called humanism. A humanism, boy, my typing's really small in there, huh? Humanism is, is another thing that is, comes out of atheism. And there, it's a system of thinking that d dissolves any authority structure whatsoever. So there's really all of these ideas are objective to
on that. And uh, humanism is a system of thought that rejects religious beliefs, centers on humans, their values, capacities, and their worth. And, and it has in Humanist Manifesto, the third man, Humanist Manifesto, the most recent, eight basic doctrines. They've been refined somewhat, but they've been very similar for the last 20 years or so. Um, and they read this way. The first one is humanism is a progressive philosophy that without supernaturalism affirms our ability and responsible to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good of humanity. Wow. I am myself. I am the one responsible for everything. I have no authority. The second one, knowledge of the world is derived by observation, experimentation, rational analysis. Humans are an integral part of nature, the result of unguided evolutionary change. Ethical values are derived from human need and interest as tested by experience. Life's fulfillment emerges from individual participation in the service of human ideas. Humans and social by na are social by nature and find meaning in relationships because we're like the apes, they like social groups. Working to benefit society maximizes individual happiness. The responsibility of our lives and the kind of world in which we live is ours and ours alone. You know, humanistic, Humanism is really very atheistic. The, the ideas of humanism, ma humanism magnify atheism because now instead of any responsibility whatsoever by a divine power or deity or God or whatever, it's all up to me. I'm the one who is going to determine everything. You know, and this is not a new idea. It, it really is, it's been around since Eve, okay, since the fall of mankind. The, another... Uh, really expansion on this and really precursor to some of it is uh, the writings of Karl Marx and the third one is materialism. So humanism, uh, atheism and materialism, the big three ideas with general categories out there. And bear with me as we go through this and say, Pastor, this is kind of boring. I don't want to listen to it. Well, it's really important, I think, that we understand these because these things are the foundational things that create the worldview that we live in today. Much of the media that's communicated to us, almost every uh, sci-fi movie that's out, everything that's out there has this idea of, of, of humanism in it and atheism and, and, and all of these things. Materialism is the one, in, and Karl Marx wrote in his book, The German Ideology, he writes this. The first premise of all human history is, of course, the precursor and the, the father, really, of, of communism that just took over... Uh, all of Europe. The first premise of, of human history is, of course, the existence of the human individuals. Thus, the first fact to be established is the physical organization of these individuals and their consequent relation to the rest of nature. It sounds sort of complicated what he's saying there, but he's getting to his point. Listen to what he says in the second paragraph. Men can be distinguished from animals by consciousness, by religion, or anything else you like. They themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of sub subsistence, a step in which conditioned by their physical organization. By producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual material life. He goes on in the next two paragraphs, which I won't read, I'll bore you to tears. Well, you kind of got to, Karl Marx is a man of a lot of words, and, and you had to read through a lot of it in order to get any sense out of it. Uh, it was all twisted anyway, most of it. Um, the, the basic idea here is that you must achieve everything that you possibly can, and that is your satisfaction in life. Once you get that new car, once you get uh, that house, once you get that certain retirement plan all in place, that will be the reason for your existence. That will be the sole purpose that you live on this planet. It's the pursuit of those things. It doesn't matter how you get it. It doesn't matter who you have to step on to get there. And if you read his writings, that's clearly what's being said. The principal idea is get what you can, get it all for you and you alone. So we kind of see this progression. We have this idea of atheism. We have this idea of humanism, this idea of materialism. that's all based in the idea of, of a rebellion against an authority, an authority that God has intended for our lives. God created, though, us differently. So that's the world's perspective. That's the idea that's out there. But the Bible gives a much better perspective, and it's a hopeful one. 
I mean, you saw the video before we started, right? And the one guy's like, man, I really have no hope because there's nothing to look forward to. Well, friends, as believers, not only in this life, has God given us such encouragement by the fellowship of the saints of one another and hanging out together, but also because he is right here with us by his spirit and his Holy Spirit. And he's given us his word that we glean from and learn from and, and just love him for and thank him for the blessings that he has given us in life. God created us with a specific design. Let's look at this psalm. Psalm 139. I love this. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God created us very specifically. In fact, he created us in his physical image, as we said before. Remember the verses we read earlier when we started, Genesis 1, specifically verses 26 and 27, that we were created in the image of God. And that means a couple things. Number one, it means it was a physical image that was to be perfect. Now, we have seen uh, over scientific study the last several weeks on Sunday mornings in the early class, how that there's been major imperfections in the genetic code as we get longer and further away from its origin. And so supposedly, according to evolutionary ideas, we're supposed to be inclining. We're supposed to be getting more intelligent and, and becoming more and more in this and this and that and all this. And yet what we're seeing in all reality is more and more missing things. As, as we get further away from the time that we were created to the time of now, things are becoming, there's more, quote, mistakes, if you will, in, in the human uh, body, in the, in the physical world, and all of this stuff. It's under decay. The Bible says so in 1 Corinthians that because of sin, the whole earth is decaying, literally. And that's what it means. But initially, we were, uh, a per we were made in God's image. We were made perfect. And you and I are made in his image. We are made as God is. So I can understand that God has legs and, and arms. He's got a head and he thinks. He's got eyes. The Bible says he's got eyes and a mouth and arms and legs and hands. It says all of these things. It talks about the way that God is and describes him in a way that we would understand us looking like. And so, and we also know that in the beginning that God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. And it seems as though God here in this scripture in verse 20, he says, let us make counseling with himself, the triune God once again. He didn't ask the angels. Man was not made in the image of the angels. Man was made in the image of God. Man's physical body, his image, the way that we are, the special attributes that we have point to our creator, that our designer made us. He made us to look like him. So our flesh, our body, is really literally the appearance of the flesh uh, uh, of Jesus in, in the, the body, the form of the King of kings and Lord of lords. That God created us this way, our physical attributes. And, and we have other attributes like no other creatures for our uh, fellowship with God. We have an erect posture. We have an upward gaze. We can lift our hands and glorify him. We can do all kinds of things. The psalmist talks about over and over again that, that we do to bring glory to God because he is our creator. We find a descriptive for the sixth day found in Genesis in chapter 2. So Moses backs up a little bit. He says, first of all, he gives us the highlight. The headline, God created man, and he put him in the garden. And then he expounds on that in Genesis chapter 2. He says in verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground, Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was his name. Wouldn't that be a riot? I mean, how in the world do you get some of the, I mean, obviously translated, we don't know, uh, initially God made all the kinds of animals. And, and, and so, I mean, how do you say elephant? I mean, where did, what in the world? Or at least what Adam would have called it. I mean, I can understand fly, right? Fly. I mean, that would make sense. So God gave man all the livestock, all these things. In verse 21, it says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man. And while he slept, he took his rib, one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that God, the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And, of course, women 
have one more rib than men do. So strange. Jeez, well, the Bible talks about it right there. Interesting. So for you guys, you've heard me say it before, but it's so important. God made men first because they need to practice, right? And of course, God makes man out, man out of the elements of the ground, the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, all the stuff, the same elements for which he created the plants and animals. But he takes and he takes special care with woman. And we know she's called woman because when the man saw her, he goes, whoa, man. I mean, that was definitely the truth. The making, though, of man is a general term that speaks of mankind. So he says in Genesis chapter 1, he created man in his image and mankind. So he creates woman. And later in 2, he backs up and he gives us the details. He gives us kind of the details of God's surgical techniques. He puts him to sleep, the Bible says. I wonder where we get that from. Nonetheless, this was a supernatural thing. God does this amazing thing. And so God does the first transplant ever and extraction from the male. He creates a woman. And, and there are some amazing things about you and I that are very unique. As human beings, did you know that there are things that you can't change? I said, well, Pastor, today with plastic surgery and drugs, I can do, change almost anything about me. Well, to some degree, yeah. But even some of the best drugs in the world, it, sometimes they eventually the body reverts back to the way that it was. There are 10 things the Bible really gives us in principle that you can't change. You can't change your physical features. Like I say, to some degree, some of us use uh, maybe makeup to make us look different. I don't know, as, as a guy, I, I never, I'm so blessed actually to be a guy. I, I don't know how you ladies do it. You know, you get up and you spend this time getting all ready and all this stuff. It's like, boy, if I had to do that, I'd probably just kill myself. I don't know. It's too much work. I, I jump in the shower and go. And you know, I barely look at myself in the mirror. Maybe that's why people go, whoa, check out that guy. I mean, look, I got, I got an ear hair sticking out or something. I don't know. I should look in the mirror more often, I suppose. Um, so our physical features, though, our parents, our siblings, our race, our nationality, our mental capacities, um, time and history, our gender, our birth order, um, our aging and our death, these are all things that we can't change. These are things that God has created. These are things that make us uniquely us. Another thing that's really the, about the physical image of God, the second thing is a physical image that he would reveal himself through. Marvelous. Um, the Bible tells us that God planned eternity from the beginning. He knew himself what every day would be comprised of. 1 Peter 1.20, he has chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. He's talking about Jesus that Jesus was chosen before the foundation of the world. Hebrews 10, 5, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord will give you a sign. The virgin will be the child and will give birth to a son. You'll call him the man, his, his name Emmanuel. This is, this, is uh, this time of year, we talk about these kind of things. It's so fitting, really, that we land right here. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only we, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That God had a design that he would reveal himself through human likeness. He would reveal himself, his glory through Jesus. Is that beautiful or what? That God had a purpose in all that. The third thing is that we should care really how we treat others because they're made in the image of God. Think about this next time you're stuck in 405 traffic. This is really important. Genesis 5.1 it says it's the account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. In Genesis 9, 6, uh, in the image of God, God has created man. James 3, 9 says we should be careful how we use our tongue who are made uh, against men if we're cursing at them because they are made in the image, the Bible says, of God. Lovely. Isn't that nice? Because that person or you and I are made in the image of God. I shouldn't walk up to Eric and say, well, you big one-eyed mongoose and punch him in the nose? That's just not a good thing to say. You, I'm sure, can have more superlatives than that. I'm sure they could get pretty colorful during a work week. Amen? Come on now. If you're human, pinch yourself. But the Bible says, hey, be careful what you say about God's creation because those people were made in my image. They look like me. And James is quick to say, hey, be careful how you talk about that person. They're made like me. Another way that God has made us unique is he's made us in his spiritual image. God again counsels with himself and he said, let us make man in our image, the image of man he made. He said, our image. 
And this is the great debate. After studying the human genome and all this stuff, we have discovered, or science has discovered, that there, there is only one race of mankind. We call it so many we have. America is full of different kinds of races of people. Well, science has actually said that the study of the human genome said there's only one race of human beings. There's just different colors of skin. There's different eye shapes. There's different, I mean, you know, I'm the perfect specimen, right? So the evolutionary brain began with me because I'm so perfect. No, that's not the idea, is it? The idea is that God created us all in his image. And, and the, the study that we've been going on with the, the, the incredible information in our DNA and how some gets dropped and, and over time different things happen, our skin color changes, we're all the same color brown. Next time somebody calls me white, I'm going to show them a piece of paper and say, that doesn't look like me. But what we do in America, which is really sad, is we have really, we call it different races, but it's not really racism at all, it's just having a problem with our brothers and sisters. You see, really in God's sight, it doesn't matter what color. In fact, the color of skin that we are is part of the touch of his majesty and his creativity. It's his power on display for the world to see. And so what we have in America is we have people groups. They have certain values over here because their skin color is different. And, and we have the people that are called white people over here. And we have those that are called African American or black people here. And we have these people over here that are American Indian. And we have all these people and they're all different skin colors. And what God is saying, I only made one race. And he said, I don't want you to marry outside your race. And he's talking about two races in that context, the saved and the unsaved. That's the only two races that, go, that are on the planet today. But God basically says, you know, I've got an idea about this. I made you in my image physically, but I also make you in my spiritual image. You see, unlike plants and animals, we not only have a body, but we have a spirit. The Bible says God breathed into man, the, Greek, the Hebrew word, they breathed into man, and he became a living soul. Our spirit came alive. Plants have a body, we understand that. I mean, look at a tree, it's got a tree trunk, right? It's got, it's got bark, it's got big branches and leaves and all of this stuff, but it doesn't have a consciousness. So we're supposed to have a consciousness. Well, animals can have a consciousness, but we're supposed to have, the Bible tells us that man has more than a body and a consciousness. We're, we're a third, there's a third created in, in, entity in us, the image of God, an eternal spirit capable of communion and fellowship with our Creator. You see, that's the beauty of this scripture here as we talk about God creating man because not only did God create man in his physical image, he created us with a spirit like his Holy Spirit that wants to commune with him so that we can connect with and talk with and have fellowship with God. So that you and I, friends, sometimes when we, when we, we don't know what's going on in our life and we bow, have you been there? And you've gone to your knees, you say, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's happening. And we pour our heart out to God. And all of a sudden, what happens? God's spirit connects with ours and says, I am your father. I am right here. And he brings that peace. And we don't know what to do. And we call on his name or those times when we're together in a worship service. And, and, and more often than not, when the Holy Spirit is present and, and we sense his power and we're amazed at his presence. It's a, it's a powerful thing. Our physical bodies are important, but our spiritual image is so much more significant. Genesis 7.22 tells us that animals have breath for their body and soul, the nephesh, that breath, the consciousness. But the word used here for man is that God breathed into man the breath of life, the same word for spirit. See, we're different from that because we have a spirit. Now, the second thing that we're made in the spiritual image, the point that I want to bring out is that unlike our physical image, our spiritual image can change its appearance. You know, this is an incredible truth. Every time the seed of man begins to form human likeness, an eternal spirit is born. When your baby is born, you know, you hold your baby in your hands. One of the pictures I have is your baby. You have just seen and witnessed not just the physical baby. You know, we've dedicated babies up here we had them, they're so precious. I had four boys, and, you know, with those, when they're little, they're so, and then they grow up, you know? <laughs> and it gets more awesome. But they're, they're so precious, and they're so amazing. And you, you, when they're first born, to be quite frankly, oh, aren't they cute? I really don't think they are, actually. 
You know, maybe after a couple weeks, the cuteness, when they're first, you know, some moms are just, oh, they're so cute. Now, okay, they're cute then, I don't know. You know, everybody's interpretation of cute is much different. I mean, just look at me. So, But the, unlike the physical image, you know, the spiritual image can change. Isaiah 44, 24 and Jeremiah 1, 5 say this. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Both of these is talking about God forming us in the womb. In other words, God having a hand in our life. As a youth pastor, there's been a number of occasions where a young girl would, you know, say to me, you know, I just don't feel very pretty. I don't, you know, and, and they were always told, this one gal especially by her dad, that she was worthless and she was, and she was a beautiful young girl and, and she had this self-image about herself. And I said, you know what, your self-image is wrong. And I'm not telling you to have self-esteem, but I think you should have God-esteem. That's even more valuable because God thinks such wonderful things about you. And I told her that God formed her in the womb um, before she could even think anything, before there was a twinkle in her parents' eye, that God formed her and made her friends. We're made in not just the physical appearance, but spiritually God has put this thing in us. This drive, both of these scriptures talk about the purposes that would come out of those lives that he formed, the spirit of a person and the drive that they'll have to achieve. And that that spirit can be hurt, it can, be, it can uh, come under fire. The Bible tells us in, in Proverbs, a wounded spirit, who can bear? You've been wounded, you understand what that's like. That our spirit is a fragile part that, that really God wants to have communion with so that we can walk with him and know him. This beauty of all this scientific data about our physical and, and, and all of this stuff is really important and intriguing. But the most powerful thing is when we step into relationship with Jesus and all of a sudden that fellowship of the spirit becomes a fellowship, a relationship with God. You see, mankind has tried to create spiritual definitions for man from their own ideas for thousands of years, many years. And Hinduism, um, spiritual concept, one of the things is you've got to be careful, you know, because if you eat a hamburger, you might be eating your Uncle Fred. So that's really important. So their spiritual focus, as you can see, is something much different. The wisdom of Buddhism says, pray to this wooden statue and someday you may be, if you're good, a butterfly. So you have to be conscious of that. The wisdom of Islam, the radicals today, is that anyone who doesn't agree with you, you're doing a loving thing by killing them. Uh, Judaism, we're still waiting for the Messiah to come for, with, with our borders to be established and we're wrestling with all this stuff and maybe without Christ, maybe without understanding that Jesus fulfilled the messianic prophecies concerning the Christ, we can still have peace. The wisdom of witchcraft is that there is no hell, there is no heaven, there is no God, there is no good or bad, actually. There's only you with your power to do with as you want. The wisdom of atheism is I am who I am. Sounds like another person that I know from scripture. I am, God says that I am. The wisdom of contemporary progressive liberal ideas that despise Christian, hate biblical ideas and, and creation and that God created us and resist that authority and, and be, do anything you want in government, <laughs> even become president. But the wisdom of the world, the Bible says, is foolishness with God. In other words, the wisest that we can be and the, the smartest that we can possibly conjure up to define the spiritual purpose for our existence still comes down to one fact. We are not nearly as smart as God. That old great quote from Francis Chan, if, if God is in his wisdom is as infinite as the ocean and my brain's the size of a soda can, what makes me think that I can scoop him up and figure him out? You see, friends, God knows so much. He is, he is God. He is infinite wisdom and knowledge. God created us then as human beings because of that for a very specific purpose. And that's the good news. He wants us to have relationship with him. How well do you know the Lord? When was your last conversation with him? 
Do you walk with him every day? What kind of things are coming from your life because of that relationship? Do you know the Lord? God has a lot of kids because he has a lot of glory to share. Hebrews 2.10 says, God is the one who made all things, all things for his glory. He wanted to have many children to share his glory. Since you were his child, everything he has belongs to you. You know, children are a mess. How many have been a child? Okay. Well, if you didn't raise your hand, you're a liar, so. I, when I was a kid, I was such a mess sometimes. And I'm so glad for a gracious, loving father who loved the Lord and, you know, loved me enough to correct me at times. And as there's been a number of occasions where I, I've done, I've gone, when we lived in Montana as a kid, you know, you shoot everything. So we went out there and we shot something and brought it home. Well, I had a cousin visiting. We were all proud of what we brought home. We had shot, don't shoot me now, rabbits home. We shot two lovely rabbits. And, you know, I was so excited. We got some rabbits and then we went with our BB guns, you know. And, you know, just the life of a kid in Montana. Video games weren't a thing. Actually, I remember Christmas, I got one of those head-to-head -head football where you push the little thing and then you turn it around to play the other player, too. Anybody ever had one of those? And move the little dash. I got it my junior year of high school. It was my video game. My kids now have these game systems and all this stuff. Where was I? The rabbits, right. Well, the rabbits. So we brought them home. We're all proud. Right? We got these rabbits here. We're gonna, yeah, I'm gonna show them off. So we got the rabbits. We're holding them by the, the feet, you know, and they're just in there. Just my aunt happened to be visiting. They were all the way from Michigan, and she said, "Boys, you shot those rabbits. Why'd you shoot them? Oh, no, they were just there. And we, well, we're gonna cook them, and you're gonna eat them. No, I don't want to eat no rabbits. Not only did my father make us eat them, he made us prepare them to be cooked. That means skinning the poor things. I've never shot a rabbit since. Never. I haven't shot a rabbit since, mostly because I didn't like the way it tasted. And it does not taste like chicken. <laughs> kids, kids are a mess. Kids are a mess. And, you know, it's the same with our Heavenly Father. But, you know, the good thing is, He knows that we're a mess. The Bible says He looks at our frame, that we're like frail, like dust. And yet He has compassion on those who created He loves. When I think about the love of our Father, of our God, our Creator, that we are made in His image to have fellowship with Him, I think about all the wasted time I have in my life. How much waste do I put in my life by not serving him with my gifts and loving him with my talents and helping people along the way, and showing his goodness and kindness to everyone that I meet? And we have a lot of privileges because we know him. We have the family name. We have the family likeness. We have all the privileges. We have the family intimate access. And you know what? We have the family inheritance. That's a pretty awesome one. The Bible says it's awesome because it'll last forever, forever and ever. The blessing that we have in this life as well are equally as important in that God has given us his spirit, has given us a richness of spirit, a joy and beyond our circumstance. I mean, you know what it's like if you're a follower of Jesus and you walk into the circumstances, they can be dire, they can be desperate, they can be difficult. But when you bow that knee, when you call on the Lord, when you open his word and meditate on the solution, after a while he brings a peace that can't come from anywhere else. And it's such a powerful thing because he is our creator. He made us to identify with us. He created us with a spirit to communicate with him and to love him and to have a relationship with him. I like what 1 Peter 1.4 says. It says, God has reserved a priceless inheritance for his children. It is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. It's really astounding. And it's really amazing that God is, is uniquely created and specifically that man became a living soul. Some things that are just five unique things that definitely d define us. The first one is this word che that's used here. And it's the meaning of self-contained, independently functioning, reproducing person that God has made us. 
things that move. We have self-movement. We can move things that have blood. Leviticus chapter 17, 11 tells us that there's life. The life is in the blood. The soul, the nefesh, the self-aware, the feeling emotionally responding. We, we see some of these qualities in animals, but the thing that sets us apart is that roach, the spirit. The spirit in a person, a mental consciousness, intuition. These kind of things that are given that God has put in people mostly to have relationship with him. God's purpose, friends, was rejected by mankind. It was put in the back burner, and, and the result was that we suffered because of separation from God. But because of Jesus, because God sent his son, because God revealed himself to us in the same way that we see each other and told us about his love in a way that we could understand. You see, they were looking at the mountain and and and. Moses was up there getting the Ten Commandments. There's lightning going on. There's a cloud. His head's glowing when he comes down. And they're going, whoa, buddy, you talk to God, we'll stay down here. That's a little freaky for us. So man has always had this, had to have this intermediary. And Jesus comes, and what does this child do, this child born in human likeness? He smashes that by giving us direct access to his heart by the power of the Holy Spirit because we're created in the image of God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. That's worth giving him a good, a good thank you, Jesus, for, isn't it? Stand with me if you can. <clears throat> thank you so much for coming today. I'm going to ask our worship band if they'll come. We're going to sing one chorus. I am standing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So you guys come on and we'll close this way, but let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you so much for your grace today. We thank you, Lord, for your church. Thank you for your church family. And, and I recognize, God, that nothing that we have in this world is ours. Lord, you have given all of it. Lord, you own everything. Lord, and you've created us with a uniqueness, a special uniqueness, Lord, to have relationship and fellowship with you. So Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would be able to focus on that fact this morning and that you would demonstrate your love for us by, by in this room, God, sending the presence of your spirit to convict us, Lord, to show us your love also and give us, Lord, the, the inclination, Lord, that's so unique to our spirit because your spirit speaks with our spirit that there is an opportunity for us, Lord, to have relationship. Friend, I want to ask you this morning, if you don't have relationship with God through Jesus by knowing him and loving him, receiving him into your life, he loves you just like you are. You don't have to get all cleaned up first or perfect. Um, there's nothing that you have to perform. There's no special rite that you have to try to say or an incantation, or some sort of thing you have to announce. All you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, I accept you in my life. Come in, forgive my sin, heal my heart. I believe you rose from the grave and I want to live with you. And I want to live in this life in your power. So if you've come this morning and you haven't done that and you need to do that, I encourage you right now, just right where you're standing, make that your prayer. Lord, come into my life. Fill me with your love. Show me your power. You are good. Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for this morning and praise you for your love. I pray that you be honored in our lives. You are good. I am standing beneath your wings. I am resting in your shelter. Your great faithfulness has been my shield. It makes me want to sing. And it makes me want to sing. Blessed be the name. again with your blessed be.
Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for this gathering this morning. God, I pray as we go from here that we be filled with your love and encouragement. Lord, we can't live without your blessing. So, Lord, I pray you bless everyone this Christmas season, this time when we celebrate your birth. Help us to remember, God, that we're created in your image for your purpose and glory. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, friends.